Hello, you are listening to Second City Sermons, a ministry of Second City Church in Midtown Harrisburg. This May through August, we're going to be in different passages from Scripture, hearing from different voices. Um, But the consistent thing that you will hear is the same high view of Scripture, the centrality of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. We hope that in this time where different voices are coming before our church and proclaiming the good news of the gospel, you will be edified and richly blessed by these very voices. The truth is that God has always spoken. The scriptures themselves are written from different voices, from different times, from different ages, from different age people. And so we hope that you will be blessed by this variety. Uh, We'd love to meet you and we hope you'll consider joining us each Sunday morning at 10 a.m. in the heart of Midtown Harrisburg. You can find us online at Second City Church or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We hope you enjoy this sermon. God bless. As we think about this sermon this morning, this text that was just wonderfully read of Jesus interacting with that young man, I would love for each of you, if you remember anything today, is that all things are possible with God, and we are utterly and absolutely, completely, everlastingly, absolutely dependent upon God. Everything that we have, the beautiful intellect that is expressed in people's lives, our physical abilities, our our interests, our desires, our weaknesses, everything that we are and have is a gift from God. And we have nothing that we can use and generate to make God be pleased with us outside of Christ. We alone have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. There's nothing else. And Jesus goes here to make that clear in this sermon, in this passage, where he interacts with the rich young ruler, and then he tells a parable, which we will look at next week, to emphasize that point as he will talk next week about the first shall be last and the last shall be first. For Jesus turns the world right side up as we see it so often upside down. Let us pray. Glorious God in heaven, thank you for giving us your word that truly is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we ask, Lord, this morning as we hear your word as it's preached, that you would speak to each of us exactly where we are, as you have made each of us different in a way that is pleasing in your sight. Take us where we are. Strengthen us where we are weak. Humble us where we are prideful. And use us that we would trust you with every aspect of our lives. And you would take us from here to be your faithful instruments, not relying upon our strength, but trusting in your strength to do that which you have called us to do unto your glory and for the blessing and benefit of others. I thank you in the glorious and precious name of Jesus. Amen. What is your most important question? As I mentioned about the, the young representative that I talked with a couple weeks ago, he had a particular important question that he brought out and wanted to ask, and I was blessed to be there to talk to him about it. For many of us, it varies depending upon our stage of life or our current living situation. If you are interested in being married but have not found that special someone, your most important question to which you seek an answer may be, who will it be? Will it ever be, or how will I know who is the right one? I know that was a big question for me in my late 20s before I met my wife in my just after I had turned 30. But that question was high on my list for those couple years. Prior to that, it was, where do you, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? If you are awaiting the results of some medical test for a potentially serious condition, then what may be foremost in your mind is whether the report is good or bad. Waiting is so difficult. 
for us when we are unclear about what is going to be the answer. Maybe you are wondering, what is the meaning of life on earth? And what may follow this life when your body dies? I know that was in my very early 20s, that was the question I was asking. What happens after here? No matter how much I could do as I was preparing to uh, do courses to maybe be in the medical field. But one thing that hit me hard was, no matter how good a doctor I might be, every one of my patients will ultimately die. And that question impacted me. Each of us have questions that are important to us, so we can likely relate in some manner to this man's important question that he brought to Jesus. The man in this account has a question for Jesus and comes right up to Jesus to ask his question. However, just before this, as recorded in Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15, Jesus is involved in another situation of clarifying wrong thinking. As we know and we read the Gospels, Jesus did that a lot. Jesus' disciples try to keep little children from being brought to him so he can place his hands on them and pray for them. However, Jesus would have none of it and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In a similar manner, Jesus is recorded in Mark 10, 15 as saying, I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And we know little children, until they get just a little bit older, they usually believe whatever we tell them. There's a a great amount of trust. They are utterly dependent upon their parents for what they need and understand about the world. You know, when there's a, a, even before they're toddlers, there's, what, what? When we, Kathy and I, went over to China to adopt our first child. Uh, We did not know the language. We learned a couple phrases to be polite. And when we got her finally at the hotel, we were holding, I was holding her arm. She was going, da, da, da. And we were eager. What does that mean? What does that mean? It's just gibberish, they would tell, which is what it is in English, just gibberish. But it was a wonder. And they were looked, she was looking to us for that complete answer. No one else. We were the ones that were taking care of her. We were her adopted parents. Now here is a man who needs to talk to Jesus. He has an important question to ask Jesus. The disciples do not resist him, but it is revealed in the passage that he goes away sorrowful. While we are told the children are blessed and the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Again in verse 16, And behold, a man came up to Jesus, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? This is an interesting thought that has captivated mankind as long as we have existed. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve have sinned against God by eating the forbidden fruit and now recognize they are naked and are ashamed. So what do they do to try and fix their desperate situation? Do they cry out to God for mercy and help in their great time of need? No. They try to solve it themselves by putting on fig leaves that will in a short time dry up and blow away. We know what happens to a leaf when we separate it from the tree and let it sit there for a while, eventually dries and turns to dust. However, we later learn what God does for them to cover their sin and nakedness. He kills one of his own creatures as a blood sacrifice and covers Adam and Eve with the skins. These skins provided by God will last much longer than the leaves that Adam and Eve foolishly tried to use to cover their sin. Much later, as recorded in Genesis chapter 15, during the life of Abram, who was later renamed by God as Abraham, we are blessed with this recounting of God's covenant with Abram. The cutting of the covenant was a time when two leaders from individual groups representing what what groups they were. In this case, it was Abram representing the people of God, and it was God. And they got together. And there were a covenant made. This is what you must do. This is what you must do. If you don't do this, 
this is what will happen. And this what will happen was represented by taking multiple animals, large and small animals, cutting them in half, separating them, creating a stream of blood that would go before. And then what would normally be done is that each representative would walk between their feet, stepping in the stream of blood, signing and committing to this covenant, saying by doing such that if we break this covenant, let it be done to us what has been done to those animals. But in this account in in, in, uh, Genesis 15, we have this in verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. If you didn't catch what was going on there, it wasn't God and Abram going through the cut pieces. It was God alone as he represented himself with the smoking pot and the flaming torch. That God took upon himself the keeping of this covenant. And if it is broken by either party, and it was broken by us, it will be paid for by God. And it was done so through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Like Adam and Eve and Abram and many others, this man had a question for which he thought he had a suitable answer. But in reality, he had no clue. He wrongly thought he could do something to make himself right with God. Consider Jesus' answer to this man's important question. In verse 17, And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Jesus, as always, turns things around for truth, not one's false understanding of reality. Jesus confronts the man's assumptions with truth by reminding him that there is only one who is good. And it is not this man, nor any other creature. No matter what this man does, no matter how hard he may try, he cannot do enough to merit eternal life. Or another way I like to express it, to merit peace with God, fellowship with God. Not just eternal life, which is the ultimate outcome, But it is fellowship with God, peace with God, knowing his presence, understanding his ways, seeing him as he is and has been willing to reveal himself. He, like each of us, always begins with a sin-corrupted nature, which we inherited from Adam and Eve that adversely affects all aspects of our lives. Jesus rightly directs the man To consider the law of God, for God alone is good. The Apostle Paul summarized the teachings of the Old Testament concerning trying to achieve goodness by one's efforts, as we have recorded for us by the Apostle Paul in Romans 3, verses 10 through 18. What then? Are we Jews any better off as related to the Gentiles? No, not at all. For we all... For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, and that accomplishes everybody. There was only two kinds of people to the Jews. There were the Jews and everybody else, the Gentiles, the Goyim. Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace. They have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This makes it clear to all who can and will hear This man and all the rest of us have no way to be or do good enough to have God obligated to us for peace with him unto eternal life. If it is to happen, 
It must come another way. It can't come from any of us. It must come through another acting on our behalf. And I'd like to remind you again of something that was incredibly helpful for me as I would read through the Bible. Some of us might have done that, tried to read from Genesis to Revelation and wondering, how do we connect it all? If you go to John 17 and you read through that, you might come up with these three points, but they were pointed out to me in one of the first classes I had at seminary. And it is the glory of God, three threads that are intertwined all through Scripture. The glory of God is at the top. A people of God. And then a redemption of those people through a mediator. And we see that glorious story of redemption from, Gen- redemption from Genesis to Revelation. Even so, it must come through another acting on our behalf. Even so, Jesus continues the conversation with the man and patiently receives the man's follow-up question and then promptly answers it. It is beautiful to recognize here that Jesus is being patient with this young man. Not right away saying this is what's right and this is what's wrong, but allows him to work his way in to where he becomes convicted by his very own words. The man said to Jesus, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus gives this man a long but incomplete list of the Ten Commandments, of which commandments he needs to keep. Maybe you caught on to that. Some people call it the second table of the, of the commandments. Not the first four, but it was the last five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten commandments and the, the second greatest commandment. It is truly interesting which commandments are notoriously missing from Jesus' list. The very first four commandments. We know from Jesus' sermon, these, excuse me, these are commandments that strike at the heart of living for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the most complete manner with other people. We know from Jesus' sermon on the mount that when God speaks of a person sinning, it is not just by wrongly doing something physical, such as murder or adultery. It also includes our attitude. And thoughts as well as, as well and speaks of the overwhelming seriousness of our sin when he says in Matthew 5, 27 through 30, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his, in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, Tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now Jesus is clearly speaking here of hyperbole, of the seriousness of sin. We shouldn't be going around gouging out our eyes and cutting off our hands. But he wants us to recognize the seriousness and to flee as Joseph did before Potiphar's wife. Don't even think about it and talk about it. Flee. Stay away. Nevertheless, with all that seriousness of sin, the man responds to Jesus with a boldness either born out of naivete, foolishness, or personal arrogance and says, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Bring it on. Sometimes we act like that, don't we? The arrogance in our own hearts that we have done enough. What else do you need me to do, Lord? However, without challenging this man's bold claim to have obeyed the fifth, sixth, seventh, and ninth commandments, as well as the second greatest commandment, Jesus raises the bar to expose this man to the reality of his own sinful heart his sinful mind, and true allegiance, Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, meaning complete, mature, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. 
Jesus presents to this man, this man with a call to obey, the first most basic of commandments, which is to have no other gods before the one true and living God. He is to be loved with one's whole heart, full mind, entire soul, and our complete strength. Not to gain God's favor by our effort, but as a response to that work in us, as He fills us with love and compassion and joy and hope, we can't help but to follow in that path. To love Him and to serve Him as He so rightly deserves. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You may be thinking to yourself, what was this guy thinking when he said he had kept all these commandments since his youth? We may wonder what he really understood about the commandments of God. What had he missed with all of the sacrifices God had called his people to make for all of their sins for all of those years and years? The blood sacrifices, all the sacrifices. But he missed it. How had he missed the key understanding that there is nothing any sinner can do to make up for their sin? Through the centuries, God has always called for a mediator to go between himself and the sin of his people. Remember the cutting of the covenant mentioned earlier? Jesus reacts to the man's response to the calling Jesus made upon his life. Jesus challenged the man to be all for God or all for himself. The man chose himself over God. And brothers and sisters, we will do the exact same thing unless God intervenes in our hearts and minds. Until God changed my heart and mind by the power of the Holy Spirit, I did not see the gravity of my sin. I did not see what God was calling me to do. I was living a life of a Pharisee, thinking that I could accomplish enough that God would be pleased with me in subcapacity. Jesus reacts to the man's response to the calling Jesus made upon his life. Jesus challenged the man to be all for God or all for himself. The man chose himself over God. Later on in Matthew, Jesus provides some clarity of this first commandment as he relates to him as the Messiah. The one true Son of God, the only mediator between God and mankind. In Matthew 10, beginning in verse 37, Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is following of God. This following of God in Jesus Christ is serious as well as significant. Jesus emphasizes the casualty of loving one's possessions. Material. Mental, spiritual, more than God himself when he says to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man, a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus uses a material impossibility to emphasize how incapable it is for someone who values God's creation more than the Creator to ever be at peace with God and enjoy eternal fellowship with Him in this life as well as in the next. I am convinced that it matters not what quality of wealth in possessions one has. From the person with the greatest amount of money to the person with the least, and everyone in between, we can all be a rich person who holds our possessions more securely than God and holding on to God. But it does matter what one 
what value one places on them related to their dependence upon devotion to and commitment to God. If we see our possessions as more than a means to God's perfect end, then we have placed them ahead of God in our own eyes and have wrongly valued them just as the man did in this passage. Jesus described this devotion to God and value of his kingdom this way as recorded in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. And that's what happens in varying degrees for those of us who are in Christ. Other things pale. But in the midst of other things paling, in that fellowship and attraction to God, what he does is turns our black and white world with those possessions and people into vivid color. We see relationships beyond what we had experienced before. We see work beyond what we had seen it before. We see life beyond what we saw it before. It's not forsaking them, only in reference to our devotion to God. The Apostle Paul, sent by Jesus to be his instrument to the Gentiles, instructed Timothy that young follower and leader in the church, about this very issue when he wrote in his first letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Riches, talents, and possessions are wonderful gifts from God, never to be taken lightly. We can be glad and thankful to have them. They are a generous blessing from God to be used for our own personal needs, for the benefit of God's people, for the furthering of his kingdom, and for his glory and honor. But the disciples were confused with what just happened between Jesus and the man. Maybe thinking to themselves, if this man can't be saved, and he has done all that he did, what hope do any of us have for eternal life? When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? And that's a reasonable question in a context of works righteousness. Well, if this guy's works didn't count enough, whose will? So Jesus, in his usual wonderful way, speaks directly to the issue with surgical precision. precision. He goes to the heart of the matter with his disciples gathered before him and lays out the truth and reality of the matter. He turns on its head theirs and our sinful, self-centered, self-righteous, and selfish thinking and gives us the best news we could ever hear. He speaks to the eternal truth in everlasting love as only he can do with laser-focused accuracy. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The deception is ever so subtle for each of us. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to root out our idolatry. My hope is that some of these questions may be used by the Holy Spirit to help each of us come to a better understanding of what each of us is at times holding on to more than to Jesus. Just a brief example before I offer the questions, as with my work at Ministry to State. I'm still wrestling, even after these 
40 plus years of being a follower of Christ, I wrestle with these issues. I'm not doing enough. And as I was being away from the the Capitol for General Assembly, and then I got sick, and I'm going, oh man, I'm so behind. I'm not doing enough. But when I go to the Capitol, eventually on a Thursday and Friday, God just opens the floodgates of interaction with people. People remembering that I hadn't been there for a while. People introducing me to someone I had yet to meet. One representative, I'm standing in line to get a breakfast burrito. He says, do you know so-and-so? And I, nope. And we introdu- got introduced to each other. We started talking a little bit. And the guy who introduced me left because he got his stuff and he left. And we started talking. And right away, the, the representative started telling me about the Bible study he's been holding in his district office every Thursday since he came into office. First thing on the information. And that's what he talked about. And God again reminded me in my own weakness that he will do enough. Am I willing to go? Am I willing to be used? And God can use every one of us. What in your life are you seeing as hands off by God? Like the man who asked Jesus his important question. To what in your life are you holding tighter than you are to Jesus? I told you what I'm holding tighter, and I'm still at times holding. I need to be convicted. So if if it's something that you hold and then you let go, and then you hold and you let go, keep working it. Don't ever give up. Keep crying out to God. Even when we don't cry out to God, he does work in us. What do you think is valuable enough for you to do to gain God's favor and his eternal salvation? I still at times wrestle with being a recovering Pharisee. Is there anything in your life for which God has no claim? There is a cost to discipleship for each of one of us. Each one of us must give up the gods we place in front of the one true and living God in Jesus Christ. It is subtle, yet ever so real. It is worth our greatest effort to sell off everything to which we try to cling and buy the plot of land or the pearl of great price as they represent our finding, our everything in Jesus and giving our all for God in Jesus Christ while putting all our treasures at his feet to be used as he sees fit for his glory. David in Psalm 86, beginning in verse 11, said, was moved by God to describe it this this way. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. Jesus delivers to his disciples a death blow for their false thinking that they can do something in their lives to obligate God to lavish his peace and joy upon their lives. While instantaneously Jesus lavishes upon them the glorious truth about God that all things are possible with him. So as we leave this lovely passage, may we be reminded that God's call for obedience is not one for which we accomplish in and of ourselves as the young man in this passage wrongly thought. Rather, it is as Augustine of Hippo, or the Apostle Paul, and Jesus the Christ rightly described God's call to obedience richly and thoughtfully expressed for us in these three precious words, precious uh, comments. Give what you command, O Lord, and then command what you will. Augustine. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And then Jesus, let me assure you of one thing. You aren't looking for me because of the signs you saw. Rather, it is because you ate the loaves and were satisfied. Don't work for food that perishes, but for food that remains to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. He is the one on whom God has set his seal. Then they said to Jesus, what should we do to accomplish God's works? Jesus answered them with these words. This is God's word, work, to believe in him whom he has sent. 
So as we draw this to a conclusion, I want to help you. This is hard. It's difficult. But maybe this that I've mentioned before could be helpful. Pray, prepare, participate. Ask God to show you the idols of your life. Simply ask him. Ask him to mercifully make clear to you where you are treasuring something or someone more than you treasure him in Jesus Christ. Prepare. Ask God by the power of the Holy Spirit to show you how you can turn from trusting and treasuring these idols of your heart more than you do him. Go to the Bible. Read and meditate on it. Talk with a friend. Seek counsel from an elder in this congregation. Join a Bible study. Read a good book about idols of the heart. And then participate. Ask God to give you the strength and will and determination to work to remove these idols from your life as you seek to love Him with your whole heart, your entire mind, your total soul, and your complete strength. Make the Lord's Day the center of your week. Prepare it. Prepare for it from Thursday through Saturday. And then reflect upon it from Monday through Wednesday. This is not easy. It takes much work and sincere humility coupled with trust in God through Jesus Christ. It takes time, as any discipline does. Don't get discouraged when things don't always work the way you have. But it is worth it to be brought closer to God. There will likely be times when it feels more like you are taking three steps forward and then two steps backward. Don't get discouraged when that happens. Do not lose hope. For that which God has called for you to do is good for you, even at times with significant cost. But it is he who will accomplish it in you for your benefit, for the blessing of others, and for the glory of his great name. As William Carey wonderfully said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Let's pray. Glorious God in heaven, thank you for your wonders, wonderful gift of life in Christ. Please speak to our hearts. Guide and direct us as you desire. Continue to allow us to see your glory. Show us our sin and keep us from hiding in the shadows and enable us to walk into the light that we are exposed before you that you will do with us, refine us, and change us as you see fit for your honor and glory. I thank you in the beautiful and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening to Second City Sermons podcast. We hope this sermon has encouraged you to worship God and to celebrate the gospel of Jesus. Please consider subscribing to this podcast and joining us in person each Sunday at 10 a.m. You can find us online at secondcitychurch.org and on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thanks again for listening. God bless.